Hi and welcome to Pain Lab Lectures. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about two dimensions and three dimensions. Since the chapter of vector has already been done in the previous lecture, I'm going to tell you how to locate uh, a particle, say, in three dimensions. Say here the P, the first position here that I'm going to indicate is the the particle's initial position, uh, indicated by R1, and P of x comma y comma z is the location. And the vector R extending from the origin till point I1 is the unit vector or the position vector. Um, so here R2 is the change in the position and hence what you get is the displacement. So delta R again here is the displacement R, R2 minus R1. The final position minus initial position. It's the same thing that we deduced in the one dimensional uh, motion lecture. Uh, that's the, the displacement is always the final position minus the initial position. But here we have given direction to it, so you better be careful. So now, what will be the equation? Here, vector r is given by xi cap plus yj cap plus zk cap. So now, for r2, what we are going to do is x2 i cap plus y2 j cap plus z2 k cap minus x1 i cap plus y1 j cap plus z1 k cap and now what you are going to do is you take i common then you get x2 minus x1 i cap y2 minus y1 j cap and now z2 minus z1 k cap you know where this is going so delta x i cap plus delta y j cap plus delta z k cap is the final equation that you need for delta r. So the displacement can be written as delta x i cap del plus delta y j cap plus delta z k cap. Alright? So a simple equation that um, anyone can you know, solve pretty easily. So from now this, from this equation, we will have to remember very, very well. We're going to deduce more equations. All right. So from now that we'll just recall the equation delta x is nothing but the, the sorry delta r delta r is nothing but delta x i cap plus delta y j cap plus delta z k cap right so this is the equation so if we apply limits delta t tending to zero to this equation you get delta v or just v mentions vector v you get vector v get vector v v here is vx i cap plus vy j cap plus vz k cap and v here as you can predict it's the velocity vector so the velocity vector can be written as vx i cap plus vy j cap plus vz k cap right and then what is the value of vx here vx is equal to dx by dt Vy is equal to dy by dt and vz uh, will be equal to dz by dt in the equation. Alright? So now, now I think we are very, our basics are, are pretty strong right now at this point of time with the lecture. So what we will do is we will move on to the velocities and the acceleration vectors and uh, we'll introduce uh, instantaneous velocity again what we did in the in the in the one dimensional motion lecture so here if you recall we uh, average velocity average ac velocity is given by delta x by delta t it's the same formula here it, instead of delta r that we reduce, reduced here I've written delta x because 
equation is always uh, x is better for mean because I don't want to get confused neither you should get confused because of that so here x is the display total displacement delta x by total time taken delta t so what happens if you apply limits to this well you get dx by dt so if you apply limits you get the instantaneous velocity again it's dx by dt is the instantaneous velocity without limits delta x by delta t gives you the average velocity and with limits uh, you know you get the instantaneous velocity the same way for acceleration so now for v average I'm going to take this equation here v instantaneous if I differentiate it once right differentiate it once again v instantaneous if I differentiate it once I'm not going to repeat the same formula here uh, but I'm just going to tell you if I differentiate it once with respect to t what I will be getting is nothing but d square x by dt squared so this equation is nothing but the acceleration um, you know, acceleration the instantaneous acceleration uh, it can also be written as dv velocity by dt you can either write it that way or you can write it this way both are same but here you are substituting for displacement if you, if you differentiate the displacement twice you get instantaneous velocity directly or if you have an equation for velocity and if you differentiate it once you get the instantaneous velocity uh, sorry acceleration instantaneous acceleration I do apologize for that mistake however so this sums up our uh, basics about uh, you know the accelerations and the velocities of course in the same way that we represented a uh, vector r uh, you know the, the position vector r you can represent velocity as I say I've written vx i cap vy j cap plus vz k cap again acceleration vector can also be represented in this way vx ax i cap plus ay j cap plus az k cap so you can represent it in either of these two equations depending on what you want and how the problem is uh, you'll know better when we solve the problems after this series of lectures are completed um, so for now these uh, formulas if you can note it down and hopefully you can solve it on your own based on the understanding that you have uh, it will be very helpful for you alright so the next thing that we'll be moving on to is is the equations of motion that have not that we have not discussed since you know I'm not going to derive all these uh, equations of motions because it's kind of uh, well of course both are uh, two of these equations which are we're going to discuss out of three are big derivations so I'm not going to do we don't have enough time uh, but here I'm just going to mention it since you know the meaning of displacement, velocity, acceleration. I think you'll have no difficulty in putting these uh, equations in problems and solving. The first equation we're going to use is uh, v equals u plus a t. So he, here v is the final velocity, u is the initial velocity, a is the acceleration, t is the time taken. And here in this equation, x is equal u t plus half a t squared so here again x is the displacement you can also write it as x minus x naught the final displacement minus initial displacement or you can write it as delta x is equal to u t plus half a t squared you know, wherein u is the initial velocity again and acceleration is represented by the locus a or you can write this use this equation u square v square minus u square is equal to 2 a x so here v square is the final velocity u squared is the initial velocity uh, I mean the squared minus sorry is equal to 2 times the acceleration times displacement gives you, uh, you know, the, the increase in velocity in one sense uh, and we are going to try the difference between the initial velocities and the final velocities alright so this uh, some sort of equations of motion. These equations of the motion are applicable only if the body is accelerating uh, 
are traveling in a uniform acceleration or the rate of change of velocity is uniform, you know, quite same, both are same. Yeah. All right, so the next thing that we are going to discuss is something rather bit complicated, to be honest, uh, but quite simple. If you know, uh, you know parabola and, and its equations and stuff, so I'm expecting you to know that. So here, um, of course, I'm trying my level best to keep it simple. Because when I learned this, uh, I didn't know parabola. So I think it'll be totally cool if I can just introduce you to that right now. Um, so first here, I'm going to make this assumption here. These are the reference uh, lines that I always do. This is our two dimensions uh, yeah, that we're considering now, x and y. So here, so this is the, so this is the origin, and this is say point R, and this is one of the points that I'd like to later, uh, for, you know, mention about this is the initial u vector. U, here, vector represented by u, and here. So I'm going to write and fill it up later. Alright. So, what I'm going to introduce you to is, is something called as the projectile motion. A projectile motion is a motion in which a projectile or a body is initially propelled by uh, initial velocity u and later on it reaches certain height and the only acceleration that the body uh, experiences is the acceleration due to gravity okay there is no other acceleration other than the acceleration due to gravity and we have discussed that the acceleration due to gravity is uh, a constant acceleration that means the acceleration doesn't change so it's a uniform acceleration that's, that's already been said so here, the initial uh, you have the initial velocity. You're giving your initial velocity. You're pumping something out. You're throwing something hard. Then the, it's a projectile. This is also a projectile. If I throw something hard, you know, like uh, say if you're in a cricket match and the ball goes deeper into the field, into the outfield. Say a third man area, and the and the third man pick up picks up the ball and throws it back to the keeper. Then the ball it, it acts as a projectile. So he has to calculate how much initial velocity. It's he is he's throwing with some velocity. So he's throwing it with some initial velocity, and uh, in the same way, that's the direct you know the trajectory is is represented in this in this in this particular way. So here is the player, and here is the keeper. So the ball will follow a parabolic trajectory to to the keeper. So what is the equation of the trajectory? The equation of the trajectory in simple terms can be written as ax plus bx squared. As I said, the bx squared, the power 2, the highest power 2 in the equation represents, uh, I mean, it clearly indicates that the trajectory is a parabola. And um, it's the simplest of the equations here. a and b are constants, all right? But for this uh, particular example that I've taken, the, you know, the equation is tan theta into x plus g x squared by 2 u squared cos squared theta. This is the equation, this is the general equation of trajectory, the first equation. The second equation is the, the equation uh, that you are looking for, for this particular example that I have taken. All right. So now, let's take some vectors here and calculate uh, how the motion takes place at uh, various points in the trajectory of the parabola or trajectory of the projectile. Okay. So the first thing, vector u. How can you write a vector u? U x i cap plus u i j cap. Since it's just two dimensions, vector u can be written as u x i cap plus u y. J cap. It's not V here. It's U Y J cap. All right. 
Then again, if we resolute these vectors, the value of ux is equal to u cos theta and ui is u sine theta. Alright? And here again, we can write this u cos theta and here u sine theta. Here u sine theta is absent because at the highest point there is no vertical component. So it's only the horizontal component u cos theta. Again here you write it is uh, u cos theta and uh, u sine theta as it is falling towards the ground. Alright? So it's pretty simple. And uh, one thing to be noticed during the trajectory of the parabola is that at any point in the trajectory of the parabola, vertical motion is independent of the horizontal motion. So they don't play any kind of role um, with you know, each other. So horizontal motion is totally independent of what happens vertically. And here, uh, well, there is only horizontal motion. And here, there is both, and they are both independent. All right. And also one more thing that has to be noted is that the horizontal component during the trajectory of the parabola remains almost constant but the vertical component keeps on changing throughout the trajectory of the parabola. Alright? And the maximum distance reached by the parabola, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, like in the, par with the parabola trajectory, the pr maximum distance reached by the projectile is uh, called as the range of the projectile and the maximum height attained by the projectile is called as the maximum height and the total duration of time taken for the projectile to reach from the initial point to the last point or the range or R as, a, as that's been represented here is called the time of flight. Alright, I'm not again going to derive those equations again. Um, again it's, it's a bit complicated or in a time consuming in one sense. Nothing is complicated in the field of physics. Uh, it is time consuming rather or sometimes it's uh, well most of the times it's just time so you just don't have to worry about this the equation is the R can be written so the R is u squared sine 2 theta by g and the maximum height attained is u squared sine squared theta by 2g and time of flight that's what it's called the time of flight or the total time is 2u sine theta by g alright so these are the very important equation one has to remember the three equations the range is given by u squared sine 2 theta by g h is equal to u squared sine squared theta by 2g and time of flight is given by u sine theta by g so if you are a very good mathematician or if you have some good knowledge uh, with the angles and stuff the trigonometry you will know range will be maximum if theta is 45 degrees so if you substitute theta is 45 here sine 2 theta becomes sine 90 and a range is u squared by g so it depends on the range depends on the angle of uh, the initial angle here theta is this the angle subtended with the x axis here sorry that I didn't mention uh, in the beginning theta is here so sine to u squared sine to theta depends on the initial angle of projection uh, here from of the projectile initial angle of the projectile uh, you are projecting this way so theta is very very important and also it also depends on the initial velocity with which you are actually releasing the projectile so initial velocity is very very important again when it comes to the h uh, the height is maximum again if you throw it with uh, the 90 degrees you can simply make it out not with ease actually not with much difficulty so you know, just understand this but now we'll just focus on the horizontal and the vertical components uh, during the flight of a projectile alright so 
If you recall the equation that we wrote before, the, one of the equations of motion x is equal to ut plus half at squared. In this equation, u is the initial velocity, you know, a is equal to minus g. Alright, so you substitute it in the equation. But if it is horizontal, vertical component is zero. That means the acceleration horizontally is not minus g, but it is zero. Right? Hence, the equation, if you substitute that, x will be ut or, you know, ut and uh, you know the equation x is equal to u cos theta since it's horizontal that we are measuring x is equal to u cos theta into t okay so this is uh, the horizontal motion the equation for the horizontal motion uh, during the flight and now we'll just discuss about the the vertical motion and it's not at all complicated, okay? Pretty easy. Uh, so the vertical motion So here again the same equation, x is equal to ut minus half g t squared. So this will be the equation that we are using. Again, if you are considering a body that is falling freely under gravity and you want to find out x, the displacement, or you know, in this case height that you will be finding h in other problems, not in the projectile, then you use this formula itself. But here again, this x, you know, again is the x itself, uh, u, u sin theta, again the t is the same thing and half g t squared. This is the equation for the vertical motion of a projectile. That you use this equation x is equal to u sine theta into t mi minus half g t squared where g you can use it as 9.8 if you have a, if you have a very good um, uh, hold of mathematics or you might as well use 10 if you don't have a calculator or if you have a calculator better use whatever you want to either you can use it as uh, use 10 or 9.8 meter per second squared alright so in the equation so these the, this, I think, sums up uh, the projectile motion that we wanted to discuss about in the two dimensions. Now we shall go to something that we haven't discussed in the relative, mo uh, th there is the relative motion in the one dimension as well as the two dimensions. The same thing, so we will just discuss. So now, what you got to do is, there is this frame of references, a frame of reference is, is something that I'll be discussing in, the, in Newtonian physics, Newtonian mechanics in, a, in the next lecture of course, uh, but now we'll just, um, uh, a frame of reference is a, is a frame or you know, um, it's, a, it's a place wherein Newton's laws are applicable. Okay, or you know, it's applicable to a frame of reference where um, you know if it is at rest or in constant mm. acceleration. Okay, or uniform acceleration. Let me say. So here, let me take one example. This is frame A. Uh, it is at rest. Okay. So this is just a v a is nothing but zero. Yeah. V a velocity a is zero. I take one more frame. This is, this is moving at a constant velocity v b frame b. And there is a particle that both frame a and for frame b observes mm -hmm. accelerating or moving again at uh, say particle p moving at velocity v p. Alright, so now these are the relative velocities. That means A is trying to calculate the velocity of P, right? So what will be the velocity of P with respect to A? Or first, let's calculate the position. So the position according to X A 
position according position of p according to a that's what that's how you write x p a position of p with respect to a wherein a is at rest is nothing but position of p with respect to b plus position of b with respect to p so the position of p with respect to the frame a which is at rest is equal to the position of b the frame b with respect position of p with respect to frame b which is moving at constant velocity vb and again the position of b with respect to p with respect to a right so this is the equation that you get xpa is equal to xpb plus xba so the position of p with respect to a is equal to position of p with respect to b plus position of b with respect to a so the person in frame a is not just observing the particle p the position of the particle p is also observing in terms of the you know the position calculated by or observed by this frame b or person in the frame b all right so now again you just uh, uh, differentiated once you get v a v p a is equal to v p b plus uh, v b a in all vectors i mean if you want you can write it you have velocities negative velocity so this is again if you if i just now again differentiate it again this is a velocity relative velocity formula is pretty very very important again then if i um, differentiate it again what i get is something that is surprising of course not surprising to me because i do understand that v b a v b with respect to a is, i mean uh, frame b is moving at constant velocity with respect to frame a hence if you differentiate the velocity constant velocity any constant it's not the constant velocity it's the constant ag, you know anything uh, differentiated any constant differentiated is zero hence in this case v b a a constant velocity uh, with respect to a v b is moving at a constant velocity with respect to the frame a and hence it is also zero hence the acceleration measured by a of p is equal to the acceleration of acceleration measured by b of p is both the same so the acceleration of p with respect to a is equal to the acceleration of p with respect to b now what do you get that means that if the frames are moving at uh, at constant velocities with respect to each other the acceleration measured by the both is one and the same right but however if this frame was uh, uh, in an ununiform acceleration uh, not in a uniform non uniform acceleration then this result would be something quite different and of course the then the mechanics of the motion becomes quite complicated but however i'm going to discuss that i'm not going to let you go easy but we are going to discuss about the non uniform acceleration later but not now all right so for now this if you have understood that's more than enough uh, and again uh, the equation hold good even for two dimensions so uh, here vpa is equal to vpb plus vpa and the accelerations are equal to uh, or whatever the mm, acceleration measured by frame a and frame b are the same all right so so next part of our uh, of our lecture is um, is something related to the drag well, of course when solving problems you don't have to worry about this drag at all and hence we are not going to discuss much about the drag right now but we are going to discuss it about that in detail when uh, we uh, proceed to the momentum and uh, the energy lecture all right so for now here it is the drag or it's also called as the air friction so for example say take this cube you know, kind of you have to imagine more in my lectures so sorry but i do expect you to have 
you could imagine any problem. So if I'm dropping this square, um, you know, shaped, uh, say, container, then, uh, you know, the air drag on this container will be too much, too hard, too much. Hence, uh, it will be, it will slow down by a certain value. So, if you apply the same loss of flex, if you want to calculate, no, 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 say this is the ground and this is the maximum height with which you are dropping this and then you, you this is the height, so calculating the height you, you generally apply. So if the initial velocity is zero, then the whole equation it is squared is what you get. So minus h is equal to gt squared is what you get in a simple equation. Because the initial velocity, velocity is zero, h is equal to gt squared is what the height is. Hence, if you measure this, you get some height. Of course, you get get it right. No, there is no point. But will the acceleration due to gravity be 9.8, or will it will be a fraction slower? Okay, it will be a fraction slower because of the air drag. So, people when they go to space and they come back in the space capsules when they at the time of re-entry because of this air drag or air friction the you know when at the point of contact with the atmosphere uh, since they will be traveling at very high velocities sometimes around about 17,000 kilometers an hour it's a very high velocity so at this point of time the the underneath portion of the space entry vehicle will get heated up and it will lit up like a bulb. So, so much of friction produces so much of heat and so much of heat con gets converted into light and it will start glowing. Unfortunately, uh, when Kalpana Chawla was, you know, at the time of re-entry, since uh, something went wrong with that protective shield, um, you know, we know what happened to Kalpana Chaga or the Challenger mission that uh, was done, you know, that created so much of chaos and uh, we lost one of the most brilliant minds, I think, that India has ever produced. Um, you know, first Indian born astronaut to and first Indian born woman astronaut to go to space and do all sort of experiments and, um, you know, ended up in a tragic accident. So, we can never rule out the fact that air friction always plays a part but you know when you are dropping something from 600 meters it's the air drag will be well considerable you, you can you can consider it but the thing is you and me measure or we calculate problems at 100 meter level or 200 meter level maximum so the thing is it's kind of negligible but however I, when I discuss uh, but the energy and the momentum of the particles then we just uh, you know will give you a formula uh, to calculate how much uh, you know, actually what happens and how much uh, loss we, uh, in velocity takes place uh, so air drag is very very important and if, if it's not taken serious you, you know it can cause disastrous accidents So uh, there was an experiment that has been done. That was done. You know, say you fire a ball uh, with a, a pist you know piston rod arrangement or something like that. You fire a ball in air. Say it goes to about 98 meters before you know slowing completely coming to rest. The same thing. The same experiment was done in vacuum, and the ball would go almost twice 98 meters. It was almost approximately 198 meters, more than twice, uh, more than twice uh, the the distance that it traveled in 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 air and in vacuum. It traveled more than twice, so it's a very uh, important. So uh, you can now recognize uh, if a ball is pushed at a very high velocity, the drag will also be very high on it so it's important that one considers it but however you don't have to worry as I said while you are solving Newtonian mechanics most of the time you just ignore it so as if it doesn't exist at all 
Alright, so um, the next or the last part of our lecture is the circular motion. So the circular motion is a you know, body traveling in in circle. So body traveling in circle. So this is the R, the radius, and and the body is traveling with velocity v. Then there are two kind of forces: the centripetal force. And the acceleration of this body can be calculated by v squared by r. Okay, v squared by r gives you the acceleration, the, the circular acceleration of the body here. And uh, the time period can be calculated by uh, t is equal to the circumference of the circle or the circular motion, the circumference of this circle by the velocity with which it is traveling. So uh, the the direction of the body constantly changes during this uh, circle or circular motion and hence the body accelerates. It's not, it may be actually traveling in a constant velocity in terms of the magnitude but direction is, since the direction is always changing, uh, the body is said to be accelerating, alright? So this is up, this is all that I have for two and three dimensional motion. Hopefully, the you know, the next lecture will include about the Newtonian laws, Newtonian physics, and um, we shall discuss about that in detail in the next lecture. All right. So, hopefully, we'll be able to discuss more about drag, friction, when it comes to friction, and and so on. So, thanks for watching, and uh, I look forward to your uh, feedbacks, and uh, hope you enjoy.